Uh, I will speak from the perspective of um, I'm in the government, I'm in the cabinet of my country, but also uh, in the Melanesian Spearhead Group, which is the five countries of Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, Fiji. Also from the wider South Pacific Island region, which is the politically independent states of the South Pacific, who are normally grouped in the Pacific Island Forum, what is called the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, and I just want to give an overview of some of the issues that uh, we are facing in our region from that perspective. The uh, politically independent states of the South Pacific, uh, the first, one, first country to gain independence from the colonial powers was, I think, Fiji in 1970, Papua New Guinea in 1975, and then it went on. Uh, Vanuatu became independent in 1980. What that meant was that the boundaries had been drawn up of the territories and the indigenous people who are the majority of the populations of the nations inherited those boundaries and inherited those states and inherited those bureaucratic government structures and inherited those systems of administration of the territories. So brown faces moved into where the white faces used to be. And we faced the same problems. Uh, it was political independence, but we were still within the uh, economic, economically colonized uh, sphere, and we still are. So the struggle has been to see how we can make this democracy work for us, which is something which is uh, in many ways quite foreign to our own concepts of governance, how we can use this political sovereignty in the United Nations world to advance the aims of Pacific peoples. And this has always been a challenge, especially because the state, as we know, is uh, agent for corporate globalization. So what's happening in the Pacific is that there are a, a wide range of experiences in, in the politically independent Pacific of how we're engaging with those particular struggles. Uh, we have situations like in Fiji where we will hear our colleague Maureen talk more about Fijian um, situation, but situation where a democracy has turned into a military dictatorship, but it still is a military dictatorship. And that's one situation that happens. We have uh, the situation where our, our own governments are selling off the rights of indigenous people, selling off our lands. These are indigenous people. We're not, we're not, let's not be uh, deluded that it's someone else. It's our own people, our own elders, sitting in government offices and making deals to sell off our land and sell off our resources and sell off our knowledge and basically sell us out. So that's the challenge indigenous peoples face when they get political independence. <laughs> the enemy becomes yourself, or closer to home rather. So in countries like Papua New Guinea and Solomons, where you do have a lot of resources, you have lots of minerals, lots of forest resources. You see, uh, for example, in Papua New Guinea, not many people know about it, but uh, a big land grab has been happening, orchestrated by the PNG government through the laws it's put in place. The lease, lease back system, where through that system about 10% of the land area that is held by the traditional owners, according to the Constitution, has been appropriated by the state and given to corporate interests, mining companies, oil palm companies, so on. And uh, Rosa will be able to tell us more about that in her talk later on today. We have a situation in uh, Solomon Islands also where large, because of the resources, especially in, uh, also in Papua New Guinea, fishing resources, huge tuna stocks, that you see also in Micronesian countries north of the equator. Um, a very bad deal for, for Pacific Island countries because we don't own the fleets of fishing vessels. We don't own the processing of the fish. Uh, we just theoretically own the oceans within these huge ocean boundaries. So oversighting and monitoring and managing how ships come into those areas and take our fish has always been something which uh, we haven't been able to deal with very well. 
Uh, in my country, Vanuatu, we're lucky not to have any resources so far that we can talk of, like <laughs> forests or mines or oil or anything like that. Um, which goes for a lot of the other <coughs> Pacific Island countries, but we're now coming into the new frontier, which is experimental seabed mining. So the Pacific is at the forefront of this in the world. It's, uh, it's the new uh, era of extraction, and it's because we don't have it on shore, it's offshore. And now the companies are coming into the Pacific, wanting to explore and experimentally mine our seabeds. And this is the new challenge we face. When I get back to Vanuatu uh, next week, as the Minister Responsible for Mines, I have to open the first meeting, the first uh, consultation about seabed mining. There's no regulatory frameworks at all. Um, the companies are saying, you know, you don't know what's down there, but we're the ones who can tell you because we have the capacity to go down there. And we don't. We don't, have the, we don't have the capacity to go down and do, find out what's there first, and they're generously offering that they'll do that for us and tell us what's down there so that we know we can be sure that when we mine it, we don't uh, destroy what's down there too much. That's a new thing that's coming up. We are continuing to try to, in regional forums, to advance the struggles of our brothers and sisters throughout the Pacific. And I'm very proud that Vanuatu was one of the countries that supported the bid for uh, getting French Polynesia back on the decolonization list, which just happened. And we are now supporting the bid for West Papua to be given membership of the MSG, the Malaysian Spear Forum, Spear Group, which is going to happen at the end of June this month. So you'll, you'll hear about that happening. We're, we're pretty sure it's, it's done, and that'll be a huge step forward for the West Papuan struggle. Um, New Caledonia is a colony. Uh, of France, uh, and there's a lot of mining going on there by main, uh, Canadian, also US interests. The colonies we have in our immediate region, uh, Wallace, Futuna, we have to Rapa Nui as well, of course, in Hawaii and those other places in Micronesia. But uh, the big hotspot at the moment in the Pacific for human rights abuses is West Papua. And unfortunately, not many people in the States know about West Papua, but it is the, the, really the uh, center for human rights atrocities in our region, extreme, extreme of colonization that's happening right now. And it's, an, it's a region, uh, it's the western half of the island of uh, New Guinea, where we see there is going to be fast change in the next few years. As soon as this uh, MSG membership becomes official, it will then go to the UN. And uh, we very much hope that uh, the US, people in the US will assist like they did with East Timor, like they did with other independent struggles around the world, to be behind that when it starts to happen. So that awareness needs to really uh, be much more in, in the US about uh, the West Papua struggle. And now we're getting to the critical, critical stage of that uh, of that struggle. So for the, for the Pacific Island countries, we have the Pacific Island Forum, which has a Pacific plan. And all of this stuff is stuff that is the problem with democracy. You have things created up there which don't re reflect what the people say or want or even know about. And so as someone who's gone into politics to try and change this sort of system, we need to figure out how we're going to create better governance systems in our own country so that the voices of the people, the interests of the people are reflected in that political system that we have inherited, that democratic system, which then gets reflected up at the regional level in the statements that are made by our leaders about what the Pacific wants. Those are the statements that the US, for example, Europe, the donors, we call them the donor countries, latch onto to say, oh, this is what the Pacific wants. But when you go down to the grassroots, they don't know anything about it. They don't know what these things are saying. Um, there's a whole process of co-option of my colleagues in uh, the executive levels of government. And it's reflective of the, the failure of, of ourselves to properly engage with and adapt this democratic model that we, we have in our countries. 
I mean, I think you guys in the States know all about that as well. Um, the question is, what are, what are the alternatives for doing that? And I think there are many alternatives emerging in the Pacific. Right now, in fact, uh, we are seeing a lot more alternative voices. Just in the last uh, few weeks, we've seen the major economies of the Pacific coming out and saying, we don't want to be involved in trade agreements with Australia and New Zealand, which have been pushed for almost two decades now, what they call PESA Plus, Pacific Agreement on Close Economic Relations, which uh, is basically a free market between Australia and New Zealand and the Pacific Island countries. Um, TPP is just another level that most of us don't engage with. Um, I, will, I will say here that for many of the Pacific Island countries, we are closer to China than we are to the US, simply because they, we see them every day. They, they're much more generous with projects, few, much uh, fewer strings attached. The US seems to be kind of aloof and doesn't engage too much with us. Uh, so there's that. Um, and of course, the Chinese are much more present in the Pacific, I think, than the US is, except for the, the American, uh, the, or form, former American colonies. These are some of the issues that we are engaging with. And um, I think I'll stop there and hand over to my colleague who works much more with uh, the out-of-government level. But um, we are very much hoping to continue to engage with the rest of the Pacific to assist us to find better pathways for development for the future. Thank you. Thank you.